All right, uh, so it's 8 p.m. GMT, and welcome everybody to uh, BSA Online. Um, today, uh, I'm very happy to host Gitan Karuna Ratne from IBM Zurich. Uh, before uh, giving the floor to him, I want to uh, once again point out uh, about the upcoming registration deadline to our physical meeting in Lulio. So please, uh, so if you have time and interest, don't forget to register and come over here. All right, but uh, without any further delay, so Gitan, the floor is yours. Thank you again, thank you for your introductions um, and also for this opportunity to present our work today here at the VSA webinar. Um, Okay, this, uh, this is, uh, the work is titled In Memory Factorization of Holographic Perceptual Representations. Um, and uh, we are happy to announce that it got recently published in Nature Nanotechnology, um, I think last month. So it's a very new paper out there. If you want to check out further things, you can go, go and have a look. By the way, the, the, the image on the left side, it, um, it's like an image we created for this work, it shows uh, kind of the dynamics that we are going to discuss today, how um, we can implement a resonator to disentangle the information using a, a PCM-based uh, in-memory crossbar array. Okay, so the problem that we are looking at is, is, uh, is I'll try to explain it this slide here. So the, this is where we try to disentangle the information or uh, attributes present in, a, in a, let's say, in a given image. Um, you, so, you, so we try to represent this using um, holographic um, representations. So we can try to first categorize different possible attributes into groups. We call them the code books. And they, they co the attributes can be coming from, uh, uh, for example, different shapes or different colors or different positions. In this particular example here, it's a, a orange square on the top right side. So in this case, the, the holographic representations, or we can call them also the um, uh, high dimensional vectors, they, they correspond to this square vector here, uh, the orange vector here, and then the, the top right one right here. Um, and these vectors, uh, the good thing about the, the VSA machinery is that we can generate the vectors for free um, using the random uh, Bernoulli process, for example. So um, once we identify the corresponding attributes for each code book, we can so-called bind them together using this binding operation to generate a, a, a vector representation for the given image. So, so far, so good. So what we have done so far is we try to encode the different attributes, um, values together to create a, um, a composite representation for the object. So we can call this P vector the product vector because it represents the, the, the product of three different attributes. Um, right, so the, the problem actually we are interested in is called the disentanglement. So which means it's the, the, the inverse operation which means we, when we are given the product vector, how do, how do we get back the, the original attribute vectors um, in its original form? So this process, uh, we call it the decoding process, uh, and it can be actually done using a, um, a what we call a factorizer, this decoding process. And the resonator network, which was um, introduced a few years back, is actually is a very nice machinery which can do this. Uh, I'll go ahead, get back get to that in a bit in bit more details in a bit more uh, time. Um, so basically, we have what so far looked at is when we are given a product vector, um, how, how actually do we construct the product vector of the, the P, right? Um, but uh, originally, like the problem that we are interested in is when we are given the image itself. The, the, the one thing is we need to. Uh, get the product vector first uh, in the first place. So how do we do it? We can do it by using, for example, a CNN. Um, but what the, the CNN gives is, it's not exactly the product vector itself, what we saw in the previous slide, but some sort of an approximation for it. So for example, here, 
we say that uh, it's called p-hat. Uh, we can kind of use the, um, a, a, a training mechanism to make sure that we make this p vector the target vector for this given image and then make the CNN train its weights so that the output of the CNN gets approximated to the, the p vector here. So which means now we have a, some machinery which we can deploy end to end starting from the image. We have a trained CNN which gives an approximate p, um, product vector, which this we can then use for uh, factorization using um, uh, the, the, the resonator dynamics or the resonator networks dynamics to get these different uh, fac factors out of uh, out of the product vector. So so here our work is. Um, based on this nice work in 2020 from Freddie and, and, and Kent. And uh, they introduced this concept of the resonator networks. Um, the idea of a, the resonator network is shown here. Basically, it consists of a signal coming into the network and, and it starts with some initial estimates for uh, X, X factor, the Y factor and the Z factor. And then they uh, do some kind of unbinding process here and then uh, do a, some matrix, matrix vector multiplications followed by a certain um, uh, binarizations of the, the estimates to start the next iteration. So basically this is the idea of the resonator. After certain iterations, it will start resonating, which means that it will keep on producing the same input and the output, at which point we call it, it has converged and then the results of the the estimates we can now use as the, the final estimates or the, the factored results. Um, so these are the some different attributes or the, some features of the resonator. Uh, it, it works deterministically, uh, which means that it has some vulnerability to what we call the limit cycles, which means that uh, I'll also come back to that in some later point in time today. Um, yeah, so what they also have is a linear activation, which means the similarity values that are um, calculated in a certain iteration uh, will be used as it is for uh, the superposition or the projection operation that comes next. This also I'll, I'll come back to later. Um, and then for the convergence, the part about the convergence that when to stop the iterations, it is it's done by using uh, comparing the, the vector estimates of a certain iteration with its previous iteration. So there's kind, kind of some memorization going on here. And uh, even though at that time it, it have a high operation capacity, we, we see that with our work compared to that, here it has a relatively low operational capacity. So this is what we pr present here today. So we present a, what we call an in-memory factorizer. So these are the salient features of our work. It, it relies on uh, this inherent stochasticity to get rid of these so-called limit cycles. I will explain this in a few, few moments. Um, and then we also introduce certain nonlinearity based on a very simple threshold based mechanism. And then um, for the convergent detection, also we come up with certain new techniques, which allows us to also now terminate early with the right results. And overall with these uh, new modifications, we are able to achieve high operational capacity up to a, at least up to a five, five orders of magnitude increase in the, in the problem sizes that we can solve. So before going back, uh, going back to, uh, to discuss these different uh, features, I think now it's a good time to deep dive deep into the, to, deep, to, to get a bit more details on the, the dynamics of the, the resonator itself. So, so uh, as we identify, the resonator, or we can now here in this week, we call it the factorizers. It f consists of four phases, basically. Um, in the first phase, we do what we call a binding operation. So this is where we, we take the, the product vector or the input to the, to the system, and we uh, unbind the, the estimate for the, the Y uh, codebook and the estimate for the Z codebook to out of the P vector. Because if you remember from the previous slide, the P vector consists of the binding of these three factors. So if we unbind the, the second and the third factors, what we end up with is the, the first factors, uh, a, a sort of an estimate for the first factor. So we do this 
so that we get an um, an estimate we call it unbind estimate for the, the first factor we we noted noted it as uh, x tilde here which we now can use to um, calculate similarities with all the codebook vectors for the for the first uh, codebook so the, for the x codebook the result is a certain vector we can call it a similarity vector or an attention vector and then we pass it through a certain nonlinearity call it an activation and then the resulting uh, activated attentions for the similarities we can pass then through again through the the the, the codebook vectors in this time at this time what we are doing is we are trying to do a weighted superposition of of the relevant vectors on the codebook x so that the result would be an another estimate which we can use for the the next iteration yeah so we see phase one phase two phase three and phase four the result we can feed back for the next iteration um, particularly for the 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 y factor and then the z factor which comes next so as we see here there are certain operations uh, which which are um, basically element wise or we can simply implement with some digital hardware but there are also uh, more uh, computationally intensive operations which consist of a matrix vector multiplication in phase two and then another matrix vector multiplication is phase four for the projection which are more uh, um, amenable for in-memory hardware uh, acceleration and this is the kind of thing we are exploring in this work so um, as i said earlier um, we have a, a hardware uh, which you're trying to implement this work, uh, this resonator and this hardware is a in-memory computing hardware and we can do uh, matrix vector multiplication on, on this hardware but not with the precise high precision so as you can see here for a given input um, uh, let's say like a when we are multiplying a certain matrix with the vector and then we have expected result or expected output vector um, this is shown in the x-axis but the actual results we got get with this hardware is, a, is a slightly different so it can have some kind of a stochasticity so if you expect a zero the measured result can be slightly off from zero it can have a plus or minus certain um, a difference or a deviation from the, the expected result so based on because of this distribution or the, this um, behavior of the hardware we are not always getting the same result so it's kind of a stochastic hardware so why does this help in 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 our particular this application for the resonator or this in memory factorizer uh, it's, it's explained here in this uh, graph here so let's say we start with a certain estimate in this two dimensional space we try to simplify it for explanation purpose uh, in the next iteration so in the white arrow let's say it goes here and then um, this is now our new estimate in the time step t plus one and then in the next time step the result goes here in the, the standard resonator which is deterministic and then let's say in the next time step in the t plus three we go here so for some reason let's say in the next time step is t plus four it goes back exactly to this point here uh, which shown here uh, which which we had in the time step t it has a tendency that it will again go to the in the time step five it will go back to exactly the same place where it was in t plus one which means it's kind of going through this never-ending loop of uh, estimates uh, which we call the limit cycle so this is the deterministic behavior but with this uh, stochastic uh, hardware that we have what we are getting we, we are not certain what we get in the next time step we can be slightly away from the expected result so with the noise let's say we will end up here in the t plus one time step and which means with this new result we will now start diverging from uh, from the deterministic uh, um, progression so now in the t, t plus two time step we will be somewhere away and by by the time we are t plus three, we are we are more or less away from where, where we should have been in the deterministic case. So which means now we will not suffer from the the problem of li the limit cycles, which allow us, as we see in the later slides, to expand our operational capacity to make uh, the this uh, in-memory factorizer work on larger problems um, without failure. Another interesting improvement that we're making is 
the way that we uh, introduce a nonlinearity to the to the attention vectors. So basically, what you see here is a let's say a typical similarity vector that can be generated through the the second phase that I described earlier. And um, typically, if you want to uh, converge faster, we want to avoid these negative, um, atten like not to attend to these negative similarities or low similarity values. So how do we do this? We, we can do this by sparsifying the similarity vector before weighted averaging them. So um, there are multiple ways to sparsifying the vector. So the, the brute force approach is using a, what we call a top k sparsification. What does this mean is this, let's say if you want to pass only the top three attention values from this vector, we can first do a sorting of the values, the, the similarity values, and then choose the highest three um, values in the, in the vector and only pass them through. But the downside is this, this sorting operation is a global operation, which means you have to, uh, it, it takes, it's consume um, some um, additional operations that you might want to avoid. There was a, a recent paper in archive, which also described new specification techniques, um, such as a normalized polynomial explanation function, which you can use. But again, with this normalization operation, it again becomes a, some globally computed metric, which again, we want to want to avoid here. This is uh, basically because of this, we wanted to uh, approximate this top K uh, pacification operation using a very simple local operator. So this is what we're trying to do here. So in order to get the specified similarity vector, we op um, um, introduce this, a threshold based pacification basically. So we, we define a certain threshold for a given problem. And then if the similarity value is uh, greater than the threshold, we can then let them pass through. For the other cases, we will then uh, zero them out. So this is what you see here, basically. Yeah, in this example, we select a threshold in the range of around plus one so that everything low or equal to one will be cut off to zero, everything above that will be passed through. So uh, how does this actually approximate the, the top K uh, specification? This is inspired by um, uh, the, 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 the behavior of, of high dimension vectors. Uh, and then if we calculate the similarities of high dimension vectors, we tend to observe that they have a, a normal distribution like this, which is shown with the the orange curve and, and then in a real experiment if we try to measure the similarities in a, for a given um, a resonator um, configuration we start seeing the the distributions the measured similarity values to have a, a something like this uh, this blue uh, histogram here so now what we can basically do is let's say if we want to uh, pass through 90 5% of the, the similarity values, we can use this, um, um, the, the behaviors of the normal distribution. Uh, and then using an inverse density, probability density function, we can find out which threshold is actually matching with the 95% percentile. And then basically uh, ca call it the threshold that we want to have for this given problem. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the distribution of the, of the similarity value or the approximation with the normal distribution can be, uh, and then its standard deviation uh, can be also derived from the configuration that we are working on. And we have a certain mathematics behind this, which we can go deep dive in later on if somebody is interested. But for the time being, I think what's, what's the key message is that we can basically approximate the, the, the top case pacification function using a simple threshold operation. And this is what we are using in our work. Later on, we'll also see how exactly it performs in, ter in terms of the uh, in terms of the operational capacity, where we try to compare the, the, the performance of the top K specification versus the threshold with specification, and we'll see how they compare to each other. All right, so this slide, we try to combine these two ideas together. Um, so the two ideas, first one is we want to achieve certain stochasticity to our, to our, to our similarity vector computation. 
The second thing is we want to uh, have a threshold based specification um, so that um, because of this nonlinearity, we can um, converge faster to the correct results. So here, uh, what you're showing is a, um, a, a case where, uh, uh, let's say for the color code book, let's say we are dealing with three colors. And now um, this is the estimate that we have for the color vector currently. And when we try to project this uh, to each of the basis colors, so for the green color, we somehow get to a point around this point. So because of the stochasticity, it can have some variation, but basically within this regime here, the blue with the, for the blue vector, the projection or the similarity that we calculate is, is going to be somewhere here, but both of them are beyond the, the, the threshold that we defined for this problem. Because of this, this will pass through uh, for the, 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 the weighted superposition stage. Um, but the red one, as you can see here, its similarity is sort of uh, below the threshold that we defined. Because of this, it will not pass through. Okay, so, so far uh, we've talked about the two dynamics. Uh, now I want to also introduce the this idea of the novel convergence detection. So in the resonator networks, how we define the convergence is using, uh, by looking at the previous estimate vector and then comparing with the current estimate and if whether they are equal to each other. And indeed you repeat this comparison or, uh, against uh, across the different factors of the different code books and make sure that in each case, the estimates are exactly equal to the previous time steps. Uh, we can also check for even previous, further previous time steps, but basically this kind of a comparison needs to be done for the convergence to be detected. Whereas now we now factorize in memory factorizer, we uh, go with a slightly relaxed approach. We are, instead of looking at the estimates, we are looking at uh, the attentions. And at least if one of the attentions from either of the three code books or F code books, if you want to generalize to one more factor code books, if at least uh, one of the attentions have ex ex um, uh, been uh, greater than another defined hyperparameter, we call it the threshold for the convergence. If, if this is the case, we will, um, terminate the, the, the operations and uh, use the, the latest estimates as the, the results. Um, so why, 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 does, why does this help? So it helps in, for, in one aspect, it can uh, save um, the, 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 the amount of memorization we want to do. So in, on, the, on, the, on the left side, we want, we'll have to uh, save uh, f, f times d bits. So d is the dimensionality of the vector. So this is the number of bits we need to save in order to do these comparisons. But here we are looking at directly at the, the attention values, uh, which allows us to reduce the, the, the memorizations. The other good thing is we can now try to find in this, uh, uh, the, the threshold for the convergence using something like a Bayesian optimization to find them the optimum value for the threshold so that it allows us to uh, find the opt optimum um, value which allows us to get the fastest convergence. So here we are presenting some results. Um, so this curve here, it on the, the x-axis, we are showing the, the problem size for three different configurations. So on the, on the left side, we have a problem with two factors. And then the problem size is defined by um, the square of the, the size of the code book. The size of the code book is defined by M. So for example, if we have thousand code vectors in one code book and another thousand code vectors in another code book, our problem size becomes um, <clears throat> 10 to the power six. So we are kind of in this regime here. So with this number of, um, with the size of a problem size of 10 to the power six, we will do a lot of experiments. We will feed in different uh, uh, product vectors and see whether the, the resonator or the factorize is able to uh, correctly identify the, the proper factors. Um, for each factor that, the, for each product vector, we have an upper bound in how many operations or iterations that it can go. 
based on the, the brute force. So the brute force or the upper bound of upper, uh, number of iterations it can go is, is calculated using, um, uh, yeah, in the brute force approach, we will systematically um, s do the similarity operations on all of, all of these 10 to the power six uh, potential vectors and then find the result. So uh, in our, in, in our, uh, in memory factorizer, within one iterations we do, in this case with the two factors, we do two similarity uh, computation steps uh, for, yeah, we do it two times, but for um, <coughs> thousand similarity computations per each code book. So basically within one iteration, we do 2000 um, similarity computations. Uh, and then uh, we, will, we will try to make sure that our um, in memory resonator does not go to this uh, uh, upper bound here. So this is what you see here in the in memory computing uh, approach. We are kind of below that point, um, but still achieving accuracy above 99%. So this is important for the operation capacity for the operation capacity to be defined at each of these uh, operational point, it should achieve a higher than 99% accuracy. But when it compare with the resonator network, what you see here, we call it the baseline. It's the same as resonator network. In the in there, the dynamic with their dynamics, when the problem size is around ten to the power five, it um, already started fading. The, the accuracy start degrading below ninety nine percent. So for any problem size below ten to the power five, it can um, decode more than higher than ninety nine percent accuracy, but with the problem size greater than 10 to the power of 5, it start degrading its accuracy. Because of that, we say it's uh, operational capacity is limited to this point here. But with the, with the in-memory factorizer, you can see it goes up to 10 to the power 10 even, which is a an increase of uh, five order of magnitude increase in the size of the problem that it can solve with the, uh, the, the, the fact number of factors equal to two. So this, we repeat with the number of factors equal to three, three and also with uh, number of factors equal to four. In each of these experiments, what we see is that the baseline resonator network has a, a certain limit it can achieve in, in its operational capacity, but with the in-memory factorizer, it can basically go beyond the, the size of the problems that we can solve with the, the computing hardware that we have actually. Uh, even at the 10 to the power 11, it works without uh, failure. So this is why uh, we say like uh, with this in-memory in uh, factorizer, we can have at least a five order of magnitude increased operational capacity. Another way to um, uh, do the comparison or another aspect that in-memory factorizer has is, is it can be, if you want to have a similar um, uh, operational performance, we can get to the same operational performance with the, with the reduced dimension uh, vectors. So this is what we're trying to show here. Uh, when the baseline resonator operates with the, the dimensionality of 1,500, it reaches uh, at the, the problem side of 10 to the power six, it reaches a certain number of iterations around uh, uh, something between 10 to the power three and 10 to the power two. Uh, and if we define our memory factorizer to be four times smaller, so the dimension is three, 375, it can also reach the similar performance at this given problem size. Um, so basically having a similar number of number of iterations at the problem size of 10 to the power six, which means we have now a very compact representation of the very compact implementation of the of the, the resonator dynamic using the in-memory factorizer. So Gizan, mm -hmm. sure. I have one question. So I mean, for these small systems, my wonder is I'm wondering where are actually where is the limit uh, for the Breen curve in uh, the operational capacity? I mean, in all your curves, we don't see actually the limit, right? Yes, that's a good question. And so I'm a little bit worried, is this real or? 
You know, sure. I mean, have you ever explore, explored the limit where the limit where it actually then would go up to the brute force curve? Yeah, so this is a good question. Uh, so the, the problem currently we also face is that when the problem size become 10 to the power 11, um, the, yeah, it becomes really hard, really big. I mean, it's, it's a, with uh, the computational resources that we have, we will take months to um, experiment yeah. with, with this regime. So this is kind of like a practical problem that we have currently. So I mean, another, another way how you could even test this on a regular computer is just at least to study you know, I mean, a, a necessary a necessary condition that that it still works. Your new model is that is that the solution is still a fixed point, and so you could just check when actually the solution doesn't become a fixed point anymore. And that for that you probably could do without your hardware. So you're saying that if it does not face the limit cycles then it's fine or is that no no i mean forget the limit cycles mm -hmm. uh, one necessary condition that the resonator can still solve the problem is that the solution is still a fixed point so if you start at the solution it doesn't wander away oh, okay okay that's a good suggestion yes i think and, uh, and this is this gives you also you can estimate in the capacity just using this criterion mm -hmm. and that's pretty easy and computationally much simpler yeah. And because I mean, the, you know, if, if, if it's, if it's not a fixed point anymore, then also, uh, you know, your stochastic getting out of the limit cycle can't help anymore. Right. So, so, so that's kind of a hard condition. If this is not fulfilled, mm -hmm. nothing can help you to, to reach the solution because the solution is not stable anymore. You would not reach the, the convergence criteria at the yeah. solution. Okay, that's a good suggestion. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ernst. We'll look into that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let me continue. From so uh, so far, what we've seen is uh, two aspects to 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 comparison. One, we looked at how how the operational capacity compares. On the other aspect, we've seen for a similar performance how how we can compactly represent the vectors of the the the, 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 the code books. So another thing uh, I touched briefly in the previous some of the previous slides is the the, the threshold based approach versus the top k based uh, uh, classification. So here the these two two, the two curves the blue and the the green curves represent the the performance with a, a so called a sorting based um, in memory factorizer and the threshold based uh, in memory factorizer for both of them are now operating with a, a dimension of 1500. As you can see, they have pretty much similar performance. Um, uh, yeah, as we saw here, we, we try to approximate the threshold base with the, the, the sorting weight, we try to approximate uh, with the thres threshold based approach. And in fact, the, the threshold base is slightly better because it has it uses a slightly lower number of iterations for a given problem size. Okay, so far we've looked at um, um, the, the the resonator implementing as as a in memory factorizer and all the dynamics uh, around it. Um, so now I'd like to take some time to talk about the implementation aspects to it, uh, how to implement it using analog crossbar arrays. So on the top, you see a, a, a block diagram, uh, how we see this. So basically considering three code books, each representing an object position and the color, we can first do an underbinding operation as we saw earlier, the first phase, and then comes a, an MEM operation for the similarity calculation. Here we uh, talk about three different layers, each for each, each uh, of these code books that we have. So the first layer is about uh, the color code book. When we do the MVM operation, we apply a certain nonlinearity. Then we do uh, the trans transforms and MVM, uh, uh, again, using the same code book, but on the, on the reverse direction, or like in the transpose direction. And then we have a certain convergence detector here, and then we can feed back for the next iteration. 
So uh, each of these MVM operations, we can, I mean, ideally implement it on a hardware uh, where where we have a set of memory devices um, arranged in the crossbar configuration, and let's say uh, each column is programmed with a, uh, a a vector from each of the code books. So basically, for the red, for example, the red the code vector for the red color, we can program on this column. The green, we can program the next column. Likewise, all the code vectors we can program along the columns. And then um, the, the MVM operation, the first MVM operation, we can now perform using, by applying your input stimulus on this edge of the crossbar and then receiving your output uh, responses on this edge of the crossbar here. And then the next operation we can perform by applying your input uh, stimulus from this edge of the crossbar and receiving this response on the, this edge of the crossbar here. Uh, with the in-memory uh, crossbar arrays, one caveat is that the, the programming itself is not ideal, which means that it will not be programmed to a specific value. So now here, actually, in our actual implementation, we look at the vectors, uh, implementing them as bipolar vectors. When we're programming them, we can then correspond to a programming a minus one value or a plus one value. But in reality, when we program it on a uh, currently existing memory computing hardware, it will always have a certain distribution. So if you actually measure the, the, uh, the final value after programming, it can have a certain distribution like this for minus one, another distribution like this for the plus one. Uh, yeah, so with this uh, non-idealities, let's see how we can um, expand this idea and then how to basically implement it with the existing in-memory computing hardware, particularly for multiple factor code books, because we see now we have even two more layers of uh, operations that we have to somehow uh, incorporate. So far, we only looked at the color code book. How do we do it for the two other code books? So basically, here we exploit another uh, nice property in high dimension vector representation. It's related to the, the permutation operation. As you know, the high, in high dimension computing, a permute operation will give you a, a new quasi orthogonal vector. So basically, instead of uh, allocating separate hardware resources or crossbar arrays for each of the factors, so in this case, if we have, let's say, a, a limited hardware resource of, let's say, a crossbar that we can access of this size here. Instead of allocating <coughs> one third per color code book, one third for a position code book, and one third for the object code book, what we can basically do is we can uh, enforce a certain permit operation so that we perceive that position code book is, let's say, uh, uh, as a permit, one permutation of the color code book, and then the object code book is basically two permutations of the color code book. In this way, what we we can do now is we can allocate the entire crossbar array for a one code book so that we can put more code vectors into the crossbar and, and then explore bigger problem sizes, basically. Uh, while when you now feed in the inputs, you have to be careful. So, so for the X code book, you can feed them as it is. But for the Y code book, we need to now do certain permit operation before feeding it to the crossbar. And conversely, on the output side, we need to do the inverse permutation to get the results the, the, in the way that we want to interpret it. The same goes with the, the third input. We need to do the permutation twice and then the reverse permutation also twice. With this way, we can now um, ex uh, exploit the full crossbar array to have an entire code book per factor and then repurpose the same uh, crossbar array for the other two factors without having to reprogram it every time. Okay, so in reality, so in our actual hardware, what you have currently uh, access to, it basically can do um, uh, application of the input input stimulus on this di in, on this side here, and then um, receiving the response on this di side here. But for the transpose operation, we need to be able to do the application of pulses here and then receiving it here. But 
on the current version of the chip this functionality is not available due to this reason we are, are now using two two tiles separate two different separate uh, tiles or two separate cores to do the the, the the similarity calculation and the projection operation so basically we pro first program the code vectors on the the rows of the first crossbar uh, first crossbar and again uh, now uh, in the second crossbar we program the transpose code vectors by by programming along the yeah here it's programmed along the columns in the first one we program along the rows so this way we do the programming twice but it's done only once per whole experiment but uh, with this we can now have an end-to-end -end solution for implementing the the resonator cross cross uh, the, the implementing the the resonator or the in-memory factorizer so on on the input side we have some additional logic first for the permutation and here we have on the output side for the reverse permutation and as you can see here um, for this experiment here we run the MVM operations with this hardware that we have, the in-memory uh, computing hardware. Uh, and there's a host computer which will do the, the unbinding operations, the permutations, the nonlinearities, and the reverse permutation operations. So now we'll look at some results uh, or some insights into the, the, the in-memory computing implementation. So. As I said earlier, we have a certain intrinsic noise in this um, MBM operation, which we, as I showed you earlier, it has a certain um, behavior like this. So there's certain um, variation in results that we observe at each point, uh, at expected point. And, and then um, this is, uh, with this noise, as, as I said earlier, we can avoid the limit cycles and, and um, on top of this, we have the in the second crossbar array, we have we try to read the results and then after the permutation, we want to now um, reverse permutation, we want to now binarize again the, the, the results that we read so that we get uh, again uh, bipolar vectors, basically bipolarize and get the bipolar vectors. And then this bipolar operation itself will have again some kind of um, bit flips because of this uh, stochasticity or uh, stochastic behavior. So here we try to show that pictorically. Um, so the minus one results have a certain distribution where some of these will fall over the zero value. The, the plus ones again will have a distribution where some of them will fall below the zero value, which means the some of the bits will flip in the when we are passing the estimates. But all in all, what we have is now two tiles, and each tile is programmed separately, which means now the, the sources of the, the noise uh, are also now coming from two different uh, tiles. So you can also think about it as having um, code vectors when you're programming them on one tile, and then we're programming it on another tile. It will have a two different realizations of the code vectors on the crossbar arrays. And in a later side, or if you have time in the discussion, I'll uh, try to also explain how these dynamics play out. Yeah, so here um, we are showing the, the effect of the, of the noise. So basically, he, this is a, 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 um, a, um, something we observe in our simulation. So we, we build a noise model for our hardware. So it's a noisy PCM based uh, noisy PCM uh, models, uh, where the noise now come from three sources. One is from the programming itself, which I explained earlier. And then there's another noise when we try to read the, the crossbar every time there will be another no another type of noise. And the third type of noise is uh, what we call the drifting. So it's um, characteristic to the, the PCM devices where because of different uh, device physics, uh, it will try to have a, some long-term effects, uh, long-term trends in, in behavior, uh, changing in the, of the behavior of the, the device uh, values. And this is what we call the drift. So based on the three factors, um, uh, we, we build this uh, <coughs> simulation model where we now can um, sweep the, the aggregate noise levels and try to perform the, the experiments. 
what we see here is that at zero noise, which now correspond to a certain deterministic uh, type of factorizer, we actually get a, a, a rather poor accuracy values here. Also reflected here with the high number of iterations. At a certain point, when you keep on increasing the noise with the standard deviation, we start seeing that it reaches this 99% accuracy. And then onwards, it will remain with high accuracy uh, until it has a aggregate standard deviation noise around 1.5 microsiemens. And then again, with the even further introduction of further noise, so, uh, it will start degrading down. Same uh, is ob uh, observed with the, the number of iterations. And yeah, so the takeaway is that having certain amount of noise in this range is helpful to have a um, uh, good performance or better capacity. Uh, okay, so now here again, uh, we're trying to uh, reformulate the, the idea of uh, stochasticity and how, how it helps in the in um, improving the, the factorizer performance. So here we are now comparing two hardware implementation, one with the in-memory crossby arrays with its stochastic stochasticity. And when uh, we have another implementation here where we replace the, the, the crossby arrays with the Mac engines and uh, memories to hold the code book, code book vectors. So in this implementation, it's, a, it's a completely deterministic. We, we simulate these two uh, in the sense that we can now uh, run hardware uh, experiments with these two models. Um, what we realize is that for this operational configuration with the problem size and the dimension equal to 256 and the factor number of factors equal to three, we get a greater than 99% accuracy this, this approach and less than 95% accuracy in the deterministic case. Also, it's reflected in the number of iterations. We take lower number of iterations with the stochastic uh, in memory factorizer, whereas here it, it gets it, it needs more iterations. In order to have a, a higher accuracy up to 99%, we can uh, allow it to have a, a higher dimension. So if, if we keep on increasing the dimensionality from 256 uh, up to 352, this is at the this is the point at which it's it's reaches 99% accuracy which means now we had to increase the dimension by a factor of 1.4. Here uh, now we are trying to look at a, an interesting application also related to the, the first part of the talk where we try to show the, uh, the this disentanglement of the perceptual representations. So basically the idea is that using a CNN, we can, we can um, <coughs> uh, get an holographic representation corresponding to an image so with the trained CNN, still it will not be exactly a match to the product vector. It will be an approximation to it. We can now feed in feed it into the in-memory factorizer, which will spit out these different attributes um, uh, for the given image. Uh, and now this problem, we try to now um, try to do it with the, uh, on on our hardware platform, and we, we try to do it as a, as a demo. So here, basically. We, we now uh, look at a um, set of images uh, synthetically generated using the Raven data set for the two by two uh, grid size. And using this, we can now do an end-to-end -end demos, demo. In the next slide, uh, we have a video which shows it. Uh, yeah, let's go to that. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the sound doesn't work, but probably this is not very important. I don't know. No one. Yeah. Okay. Share sound. Okay, I think I have to fix the share sound. We demonstrate the capabilities of the in-memory factorizer to disentangle raw images in a visceral perception task. We draw input images from the Raven dataset as seen on the left-hand side of the screen. 
each of these images contains different attributes, which are the position, the shape ranging from triangle to circle, as well as a different set of colors. This input image here shows a violet hexagon in the lower right corner of the panel. We feed this input image through a convolutional network trained to map its visual input scenes to a high dimensional holographic product vector, as seen here in the middle of the screen. This holographic perceptual representation we feed to the in memory factorizer, aiming to disentangle the product vector to find the underlying attributes. The in-memory factorizer iteratively searches through all possible combinations in superposition. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see the confidence score for each attribute at the current iteration. All the factorizers MVM are executed on two in-memory compute cores, where we store the codebooks on the crossbar arrays of phase change memory devices. Eventually, the in-memory factorizer will find the correct factorization indicated by a high confidence value for one of the code vectors within a code book, while the others have a small confidence. In our example, the in-memory factorizer converged to the correct attributes, which is the following triplet. We have lower right corner, we have the hexagon, as well as the color Violet. Okay, so let me try to recap the today's talk. We presented a novel in-memory factorizer, and we, we saw that um, this uh, recent uh, this introduced um, new features like inherent stochasticity and a simple threshold-based nonlinearity and a simple convergence detection allow us to reach higher orders of uh, higher uh, operational capacities. Uh, at least in the order of uh, five orders magnitude or more. So for those who are interested, we have a record available on GitHub, as well as the, 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 the data that we have dumped through the hardware that we have. So these are the conductance values that we recorded to our hardware, which may be useful for someone who want to do more further experiments. Um, yeah, I think with that, I will stop here. And if there are some questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you, Gitan. So now I open the floor for questions. I have a question. Yeah, go. Um, on slide 15, you showed the multiplexing thing. And uh, so is it, is it multiplexed in time? So you, you, you sort of can run each of those three things through in like time slices or they all, they all go through that uh, crossbar thing in one go? It's time multiplex basically. So even uh, in our, uh, how, how we build the software model, it's again, the resonator can be basically um, run parallelly and sequentially. For all the results that we showed today, it was operated sequentially, which means once we uh, first first we run it through uh, one code book, we collect the estimate, and this new estimate is used for updating the second code book or run for the running of the second code book. Basically, so here all the software results we also presented with sequential uh, mode or sequential mode of operation. And also on the hardware, we do it sequentially. It's basically, uh, that's why it's, um, it allows us to do this time multiplexing on the input side, also at the output side. And so you don't have to change the, um, you don't have to ch change the coefficients in your crossbar thing, or you do, you have to, do you have to rotate those as well, or permit Not those? So the crossbar remains stationary for the entire experiments. Only the okay. inputs, inputs we need to do the rotations okay. before applying to the, the crossbar here. All right, that's interesting. Thank you. Yep. More questions to Gitan?
Ethan, thank you very much uh, for that. Can I make a, a quick observation and, and then the, the actual question? Uh, your modified convergence criterion uh, is possibly equivalent to uh, a standard model in mathematical psychology. So there's a class of decision-making models, where typically it's a perceptual decision, uh, uh, called uh, evidence accumulation models or, or diffusion models. And so basically uh, the underlying mathematical model there is that um, you, the, the state of the system is some value, possibly vector valued, which effectively follows a, a random walk with drift. And then when that, uh, when that state crosses some boundary, then the system says, aha, I've made a decision. So essentially they're, they're modeling it as accumulation of evidence over time, but in a noisy system. So that's uh, what you've got there as your convergence criterion would seem to map fairly directly onto that, uh, that fairly standard model from, from mathematical psychology. So that might be worth pointing out to your math psych friends. Um, the, the question was actually about that uh, uh, top K uh, sparsification. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things, so I'm presuming, so okay, you've got your vector there of similarity values uh, between the uh, current inputs, well, the, the current unbound input state and the um, your code book of um, prototype values. And so your top K values in that would almost certainly be all positive similarities for um, any sensible value of K you'd be likely to use. Uh, which then gets you into the territory of uh, non-negative matrix factorization. Uh, so I know that you've you, you said you chose a, a threshold for the similarity, although I don't think you actually displayed where the threshold was. But I'm going to presume that the threshold is is positive. Um, so I, I I wonder. I mean, given that you know, non-negative matrix factorization is um, interesting and useful in the in the statistics and, and data analysis world. I wonder how much of the performance of this system is due to just uh, constraining the similarity values to be non-negative and how much is coming from choosing some value which is you know somewhere out on the the extremes of that distribution. So do, you, do you have any uh, have you done anything looking at you're pushing the uh, pushing the threshold down to the zero level? For example, uh, yeah. Thanks first for the, um, the insights on the, the convergence part. Um, uh, yeah. So we looked at. Um, so what what we basically did is, I think I had a backup slide on this. Um, yeah, here you can see what we did was a, is a, a based on this Bayesian Bayesian optimization. So basically we um, we have a, a certain um, uh, uh, optimum value that we want to get for uh, yeah. for the threshold and then also for the convergence threshold we basically run it through this loop so we we, we probe it with certain threshold values and see how it performs and based on that we determine what new value to uh, apply for, for the the resonator it turns out that the thresholds actually um, falls nicely in in the in the, the top k values that we are looking at. Basically, here this slide shows you um, if we if we do it using the the top k approach, what accuracies we get. So basically, um, these different color color coded um, lines correspond to different problem sizes. Um, so our um, uh, observation is that no matter the size of the problem, the, the peak mm -hmm. accuracy is achieved for a, a, a the same k value. Right. So yeah. So for, for a bigger problem, uh, still absolute in absolute terms, we want to choose thirty four uh, top values, no matter the size of the problem. And this mm -hmm. holds true for a different. So, so the different factors, number of factors. So here we see for two such factors. And how does this translate to the threshold um, yeah. domain? And the threshold can be yeah. variable for different problem sizes, but in terms of the um, the top K value, it remains, it 
it uh, seems to be that it it is the constant for different problem sizes. Are those uh, the x-axis on the threshold graph? Is that uh, effectively a uh, in a scale of cosine similarity? So that's uh, zero would be zero up to a maximum of one. Yeah, so it's yeah. your top right. Yeah. Um, okay. So so your thresholds are in fact, in an absolute sense, really quite you know, relatively close to zero. They're only you know point zero four on a on a zero to one scale of. of cosine similarity. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, well, uh, I have to correct here. So, uh, so here actually you see, yeah, the threshold, um, it's, um, it's from zero to one, yeah. So this is the range um, that we're looking at. Mm, okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Sure. Uh, more questions to Gitan? I have one. Yeah, yeah sure. Gitan, so um, if, if I could summarize that, would it be correct to say that there are basically four sort of things that potentially differ like your model from, from the standard resonator? So the one being, um, sequential versus parallel execution. The second being nonlinear ver versus linear um, sort of so, specification, as you call it in the, in the paper, right? Then the third aspect was noise. So ha having, having um, sort of stochasticity in the process. And then the fourth thing was, was uh, assessing whether the resonator is done or not. Is it as a have a missed something or as a four of them? Uh, Dennis, can you repeat the fourth one? I missed it. Is it the, the first was uh, the score? How do you assess the convergence? Ah, yeah, and, convergence. Yes. So yeah. Uh, I think the, the the second, third, and fourth uh, are, are fine. I think is what I've presented regarding the first one. Um, so. I think that the original resonator was not meant to uh, only operate with the parallel uh, decoding mode. I think that can also sequentially operate. So for all our comparisons here, we use the, the sequential mode of operation for the resonator. Okay, you use the sequence. Okay, okay, yeah. That, that, yeah, okay, good. So then, then it's kind of, okay. So it could be potentially done in parallel, but you've done it sequentially, right, yeah. 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 Yes. But then, okay, but then for the remaining three, is it possible, have you been doing at least qualitatively, is it possible, like based on this kind of ablation studies that you were presenting, is it possible to say which of these factors, like uh, relatively, how does it contribute to, to, to extending the capacity of the resonator network? Like what's, what is the most important thing? What are like less important things? I think it, it can also depend on on the at the which regimes you're operating in. Um, so, what what my understanding is that uh, the the limit cycle. If so, it based on which problem you want to tackle. So, if you want to tackle the problem of limit cycle, stochasticity is important to have. So, let's say you're operating in a regime where the limit cycle is the the main problem or the, the main issue which prevents your uh, uh, operational capacity being expanded. This, this, this kind of regime, the, the stochastic is, is a, like a good contributor. It's, 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 it's uh, useful to have. Um, if for some other reason, limit cycle is not the main issue, but still you having a kind of a, a slow convergence or having some longer, iterations to converge to the correct result and then having a specification could be the solution in this kind of operation uh, regimes so yeah i think it's yeah i think it can vary based on where you're operating in so you cannot sit uh, having one universal answer to this question i think right thank you and maybe get then one more I, i'm not sure if this is pips or not, but it's like technicality I wanted to clarify. So in your in your diagrams, like what 
when when you when you create when you reconstruct the new prediction from the resonator network and you feed it back, do you apply the sign the sign function the step function to make the the prediction bipolar again, or yes. do you keep it real valid? No, no. Uh, for our resonator, all the, the, the what's shown here represented here, we represent the vectors using bipolar values. So basically, which means that. Um, yeah, there will there will be a certain either yeah it's, it's a it's a sign function so we will apply so for the resource we collect from the the either it's from the hardware or or from the software models we will apply a sign function so that our unbinding operation always remains the okay. yeah multi okay function. so basically this feedback feed, feedback uh, lines they also implicitly integrate the sign function in, into yeah, that, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, got so it. Yeah, what yeah. What we're saving here is estimates are always bipolar vectors. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thanks. More questions? Quick one, if possible. Yeah. Um, Ethan, you were talking earlier on about the importance of uh, stochasticity for uh, breaking limit cycles. Uh, I was wondering, uh, is that a, how much you've actually probed that as an explanation? I mean, I've no reason to believe that that's false, but I mean, so did you actually have some mechanism for determining in your analysis of what was going on? Uh, did you actually detect the presence of, li of limit cycles, or is that just a, you know, a plausible explanation but hasn't been empirically uh, investigated? Uh, uh, Ashiro, so I think we, uh, so if the, the, the experiments are mainly performed by Yowin, uh, he's not with us currently, but um, from uh, from the key findings that uh, that we um, discussed, uh, it, the, rest, the the limit cycles are present. Uh, I don't have the numbers here with me currently, but it's a uh, one of the key reasons for uh, for um, uh, where the original resonator was um, was not improving or mm. where it was um, uh, lagging behind. Mainly in the the operational points that were interesting for this hardware. So our hardware consists of a, a crossbar array of size 256 by 256, which means our vectors have a dimensionality of 256. Yeah. And the problem sizes here, we try to um, also use a, a problem size of 256. And um, we looked it up to a factor of three factors. And in this particular problem, si problem configuration, um, we, we start seeing that uh, limit cycles play a major role with the preventing the operation capacity being. Yeah, I'm interested in just in the, um in the technical method. So, so what did you actually do with the data to detect the presence of a limit cycle? Because it seems to me, because uh, you know, starting from a zero, zero background knowledge here, that actually detecting a limit cycle yes, might be we, quite difficult. Yes, we traced all the, the estimate vectors. Let's say, mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a, a iteration cap, a cap in the in the thousand range. So we have to now record the estimates for let's say thousand iterations. But we didn't have to go that far. So limit cycle, if they occur, they will um, mostly be um, shorter cycles in the, let's say, up to mm. 100, let's say. So if we now trace back uh, the last 100 uh, estimates, and if we see the similar pa patterns emerging, emerging uh, then it's kind of a limit cycle. And then we can uh, mark it as a, a failure due to limit cycle, and then we can repeat the experiments with that. So you're looking at the, say, the uh, the output vector. So this is the, uh, the the cleaned up product and you're comparing it with itself over time and just looking for, um, for repeated uh, high similarity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, last chance to ask questions to Gitan. Otherwise it's getting dark even here up north. <laughs> Okay, all right, so I think everybody is happy.
<laughs> so, and I'm happy as well. So thank you, Gitan, once again, for the great talk. And thank you all for attending this webinar. So I'll see you in two weeks from now. So have a great time. Thanks and goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Gitan. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.